All right, y'all. Howdy, and welcome to the Cyber Ranch Podcast. This is Alan Alford, your host, and with me today is Philip Wiley, senior pen tester at U.S. Bank, and we're here to talk about penetration testing programs and how to run them. But more importantly than that, we're going to talk a little bit about Philip's background because he's got some very interesting stories to share with us. So, Philip, briefly, why don't you tell us a bit about your background in cyber and a bit about your day job? Okay. Uh, I've been in cybersecurity for 18 years this month, and the past 10 years I've spent on the offensive side working as a pen tester, red team lead, application security pen tester, and so forth. And at U.S. Bank, we do a lot of pen testing in regards to PCI compliance. That's mainly what our what our team does. Right on. So 18 plus years now. But there's a little bit more to your background, as I understand it. A little birdie told me that before you were a pen tester, you might have had a more interesting career. Yes. Yeah, I kind of, if you want to know the scenic route of my career path, uh, when I graduated high school, I really wasn't sure what I wanted, wanted to do for a living. And I was a power lifter, and my friends said, hey, you're a big guy, you should go into pro wrestling. So I went to wrestling school <laughs> and did that for a couple years. And during that time, I even wrestled a bear, uh, a 750-pound bear. And I ended up getting out of that because I had to find a more stable lifestyle and career. I got married and all the travel and stuff, that's not good for, for marriage and family life. So I really didn't know what I was going to do. So I ended up going to trade school and learned AutoCAD. AutoCAD is where I found out about IT. I got a job as a sysadmin and then got interested in cybersecurity. And that's kind of where I entered into that path. So what's more difficult, wrestling a 750-pound bear or justifying a pen test budget? Probably the pen test budget <laughs> or getting people to remediate the findings from a pen test. Right. <laughs> All right, so switching gears here, before we get into the pen test subject as well, you've got some other activities that you do. You've got something called the Pwn School Project, and I wanted to hear a little bit about that. Tell the folks about that because I think it's a, an important thing for the community to know about. Yeah, where that came from was I started teaching at Dallas College in 2018, teaching ethical hacking at the college and then later web app pen testing. And a lot of my students down towards the end of the semester is where can we go to learn more offensive security type of studies. And I decided to start the Pwn School Project and basically it was like a monthly meetup. We met once in Dallas and also uh, once in Denton, Texas. Denton, Texas is my hometown, so they didn't have a security community there. So I started doing the meetings there. And so they're kind of a meetup type format, but it was more education focused. So a lot of the topics were something that if you worked in some other area of cybersecurity, were interested in learning about the offensive side, that you could come and learn that. And we had a lot of people that have been trying to get into the industry that uh, attended those meetings. It started out more offensive focused, but as time went on, saw the need for other areas. So we have people uh, do presentations on digital forensics, different blue team topics and that sort of thing. And we went virtual Back in, actually, we did a hybrid in 2019 before the pandemic because I was streaming my courses at Dallas College. And so I went ahead and started streaming the meetings so that way people that were outside of the area could still take advantage of the topics that were being presented. So how many how many listeners have you guys picked up? Like, you've got an audience now outside of Dallas? Yes, we've got global a global audience. So people all over, a lot of times they go back and, and view the recordings. And that was also kind of when I started offering my classes uh, virtual, I picked up people from other countries and throughout the U.S. That's brilliant. So, all right, cool. So you've also got a podcast of your own, do you not, over at ITSP, right? Yes. So you working with Marco and Sean? Yep. yep. All right, so tell us about that a little bit. Yeah, the podcast is called the, the Hacker Factory Podcast. And part of where the, the name came from, when I started teaching at Dallas College, the registration system Dallas College uses is the same one that they used when I went there in 2001. So you can't really search on terms and find classes. So I built a website, and the domain name I got was thehackermaker.com. And kind of where I came up with that name was, if any of you remember the old donut commercial where the baker is getting ready to go into the donut shop, and he's telling his wife, it's 5 o'clock in the morning leaving out, I got to go make the donuts. And I would tell my wife, I got to go make the hackers. So that's where I came up with that term. So I built the website to be able to put up the registration information so people could easily find it because before in the past it was a real nightmare trying to get people the registration information. And so the podcast, uh, I started out with ITSP Magazine. I was doing another podcast with Chloe Mistagi and Alyssa Miller called The Uncommon Journey, and it got really busy. You know, the three of us were really busy speaking at conferences and doing other virtual events, 
So trying to collaborate, you know, collaborate with three people plus a guest made it d- difficult to schedule. And so Marco and Sean from ITSP Magazine kind of asked us individually, do you want to do your own podcast? And they said, hey, have you thought about doing the Hacker Maker podcast? And I said, how about the Hacker Factory? You know, because that's where a hacker makes his, his hackers at. So, uh, so we started that. And a lot of the things I do are focused on people trying to break into the industry. So my guests on the show will tell their story, how they got started, and make recommendations on how others can get into the industry. And actually, Joe Vest that was presenting earlier, he was one of my guests on the podcast. And one of the interesting things about the podcast is each of the stories resonate different with people. I had someone on that was an esthetician. She worked in the beauty industry for 20 years and went back to school, got an IT degree, and then cybersecurity, and then started a role as a penetration tester. And so a lot of people are always asking me, I'm 30 or 40 years old. It really makes me laugh when a 30-year-old says, am I too old to get into cybersecurity? And I said, no, you're not. And so stories like that resonate different with people. I had someone from that runs NIST NICE heard one of the episodes and wanted to speak with me because she really liked that Meryl Vernon was one of my guests. Most of you may know of uh, Meryl Vernon if you're active on Twitter and LinkedIn. Uh, but Meryl Vernon started out, she had no IT background. Uh, she was working in compliance. They had a red team job open up in her company. She applied for it and really took took to it and have done really well. It was very successful. And it really appealed to this person that's over in this nice that someone with no background at all got a job in the industry. So, you know, as I said, these stories resonate different with different people. And it's a way to motivate people because a lot of people hear this. And, uh, you know, one of the reasons I like to share these stories is because when people hear my background, you know, being someone that never thought I'd use my mind for a living, that I was able to do it. You know, those stories are able to help prove to others that they can possibly do it and encourage them and give them hope. That's phenomenal. That's phenomenal. So where can people find your podcast? Uh, If you go to itspmagazine.com, you can find the link there. You can also find it on on Apple or other podcast platforms. So. Awesome. So show of hands real quick from the crowd. I'm just real curious because we talked about right here the, the non-traditional interest. We've got a wrestler. We've got an aesthetician. Um, raise your hand if you do not have a computer science or cybersecurity degree. That's half the room, people. That's cool. That's really cool. Raise your hand if you got into cyber after doing something else originally. More than half the room. So there you have it. Anybody that wants to break in, you can do it. Yeah, and it's interesting. Joe had a really interesting story because he was starting out as an herbalist. So who would have thought someone with that kind of background? And and it's pretty interesting to hear the different stories. You know, sometimes it takes getting in to a certain part of the industry to find out what your true true calling is and true passion. That's that's amazing. This is this is this is good. This is encouraging for everyone who hears this show. If you're ever interested in cyber, you want to get into cyber, do it. Just kick in the door. So uh, we're not quite done with introducing everything Philip's done. So we've covered uh, the wrestling background. We've covered the Pwn School Project. We've covered the podcast. You've also written a book. Yes. What's the book? The the book is called the Pentester Blueprint. And kind of where that that book came from, the idea when I was teaching at the college. Uh, each semester, I'd give a lecture on how to become a pen tester, and some of the other professors at the college would ask me to come in and talk to their students about becoming a pen tester. And so by the time that was like January, I first gave that talk, and then by November at B-Sides DFW, I gave the talk at my first conference. And so it was really popular. People liked it because, you know, a lot of people want to get into pen testing. It's probably one of the more popular areas for pen testing, especially younger folks. They think about hacking, getting paid to hack for a living. It's really appealing to them. But, you know, there were, there were a lot of books at that, out at that time on pen testing, but no one told you the prerequisite knowledge that you needed, the background that you needed to become a pen tester. So I saw the need for that and thought about writing a book. I was in the Tribe of Hackers Red Team book, and the publisher, Wiley, asked me if I had any ideas for books that I would like to write. And, of course, you know, I had this idea – of the book because I was going to different conferences giving this talk and every time I went people saw this was new information and this kind of gets me to think anyone that's on a CFP review board some advice I'd like to give you there I was on the CFP board for B-Sides at DFW a couple years ago and they said if the talk's been given before you know turn it down and all this and I thought you know you can't do that if they've given it here yes but 
you know, there's so many conferences in the world, so many people that will never hear something. You know, I could give this talk every week for the rest of my life, and there's going to be people that didn't hear it. So a book was a way to share this information with people that otherwise would never come in contact. You know, a lot of these people aren't going to the security conferences. If you're trying to break in the field, you don't know that security conferences are a good thing to go to or the different uh, meetup groups and stuff. So it was a way to share that on a broader scale. And a lot of things I do it was with the new people in mind that are trying to break in. And so it's been... It's been a good experience and it's, you know, I've gotten good feedback and it's helped people kind of start their careers and motivate them to, to get into the industry. Man, you are giving back to the industry big time. This is really impressive stuff. Um, so many of us in this room have probably written an article or two here or there, or maybe some blogs or whatever, and have probably contemplated writing a cyber book. What is your advice for people in cyber that want to write a book? Yeah, and if it's something you're passionate about, I would definitely do it. It's, it's really good. Career, you know, my selfish reasons were for, you know, career advancement. You know, I didn't think you're going to make much money writing a book. You don't make a lot of money off a book, but it gives you exposure. And, you know, at one time I thought about self-publishing. The benefits of going through a publisher is distribution. So your books can end up in Barnes & Noble. Otherwise, if that's up to you, then you're paying for a lot of this stuff out of out of pocket. But it's, it's, it's really good. What I would advise you to do is have most of the idea flushed out pretty well when it comes time to submit your proposal and you have it really thought out and it's going to make that process a lot easier. But, but yeah, I would definitely go for it. And uh, one of the things to keep in mind, you're going to have to have a good amount of content because one of the things I ran into, which was a learning uh, lesson for me, was I'm pretty bad about not asking people for help. I'm really bad about trying to do it all on my own and just not wanting to, not that I don't trust people, it's just you know trying to get it done and just not thinking to help people. So I had most of the book written, and we were like not even to 200 pages. And there was a lot, you know, I'm when I write, my writing style is straight and to the point. I don't write a lot of fluff. And so I was having a hard time completing the book. So it wasn't quite to the 200-page mark. And so one of the things I was thinking about, either I self-publish, I don't write the book, I have the contract, I already told people I'm writing a book. You know, I'd like to finish what I'm doing, so not writing the book wasn't an option. So I thought maybe I could find someone else to help me co-write the book. They could come up with some other ideas of things that maybe that would help the book. And and I reached out to Kim Crawley. Kim Crawley does a lot of different blog posts for companies. She started out in IT. She's wrote blogs for AT&T. Uh, she's currently working to Hack the Box. So I thought maybe I could bring someone else in. So when I brought Kim into the project, she did a good job of telling people these other jobs, how they can help you as a pen tester, and she interviewed other people on their paths into security. So, so it was a good experience. I, I highly recommend it. it. It is time consuming and you'll have to put in the time and get, and there's deadlines and sometimes the deadlines can be kind of tough to, to meet. So, so I definitely recommend it if you're, if you like writing and, and want to write a book. All right, let's see some more books out of the crowd folks. So let's dive in and get into the, the meat of the show here. Um, we're talking about pen testing. We're talking about running pen test programs. Let's start with, uh, I'll toss you a softball one to get started. Uh, it's a common misperception upstairs that I've seen. You know, how do you articulate the difference between vulnerability scanning and pen testing when you're selling it upstairs? Yeah, this is a really good topic, and that's one area that I've seen that there needs to be more information on that we need to discuss this more at conferences, you know, because a lot of us that are working in the offensive side are focused on the hacker conferences, the B-sides conferences, and you're really not coming to conferences that are, you know, broader audience or a lot of management types. Uh, but when I was working at a company a couple of years ago as a red team lead, uh, it was really kind of surprising to me that, you know, not only business people or management, but security folks didn't know the difference between a vulnerability scan, a vulnerability assessment, a pen test, and a red teaming engagement. So that's, there's a lot of uh, misconceptions there. And, you know, a lot of times pen testing gets generalized as red teaming, just like blue team for all the offensive side. But red teaming, if you've caught Joe's talk, is more adversarial emulation. So you're more trying to emulate a threat actor. When you're performing a pen test, you're trying to find all the vulnerabilities and exploit all the vulnerabilities that you can find. But in a red team engagement, you're trying to find something that would lead to a breach. You're testing the people and the processes, the reaction time. You're wanting to see if people are reacting because, you know, Sometimes maybe they're not something in place to block it, but maybe when someone sees it, they can help prevent it and even know the incident happened. So uh, that's some of the misconception there. And then vulnerability assessments. You know, some of, there's some co companies out there that are kind of misleading that will 
say they're doing a pen test and they run a vulnerability scan and they put it in a pen test report, they just run Nessus and put it in a report. Either they're just got sketchy ethics or they don't know what they're doing, but this happens. And so understanding the difference, because, you know, vulnerability assessment, you're just running a, with a vulnerability assessment, you're running scans and you're validating those findings. Just a vulnerability scan, you're just running the scan and not validating those findings. And then with a pen test, you're going a step further. Whatever you validated, you're trying to see if you can exploit. And there's needs for all those different types of things because a pen test, if you're doing a red team engagement, you're not looking for all the exp, you know, vulnerabilities that are exploitable. As a pen tester, you're trying to find all those. So these are things that complement each other and need to be done you know, together as part of a, uh, even extending it to your vulnerability management program where you're running vulnerability scans, reoccurring, uh, making sure you're catching these findings whenever they come out. Okay. So there's a bigger picture even than that, which is running the whole program. You've got a CISO who's in charge of uh, an entire GRC effort. There's a compliance effort. There's a governance and reg you know, regulatory effort. Uh, per, you know, regulatory perhaps. Um, you've got attack surface management. You've got a tech stack that you're deploying. You've got vulnerability management, patch management. You've got all these things. How does that pen test program fit into that bigger picture? Yes, yeah, so it's kind of interesting how the terminology changes because at one time pen testing was part of vulnerability management or threat and vulnerability management. Now, you know, the terminology is attack surface management. So an overall program, there's different pieces that need to work together because your application security program may not be part of your pen test program. They may be doing things in there. So one of the things we need to do is make sure we're communicating with all the different teams. And one of the things where you can save money on software is say like if you've got licenses, you're using Web Inspect or Acunetics and another group is using AppScan or something, you want to coordinate on the tools to make sure that you're finding the best tools and kind of collaborating on finding good tools so that way you're not repetitively buying redundant uh, products and then just working with the other teams to build out this program because some of the, the ways that the application security team uh, you know may need feedback from the pen testing team so your secure development life cycle of your developing your applications you need to make sure that you've got assessments built into that your AppSec folks could be doing some vulnerability scans and testing as it goes along but you also want to put that into your pen testing uh, schedule and pen test those those applications as well. I, I love that collusion with app scans because it's or with with uh, application testing, uh, application security. It's two very different worlds, oftentimes, uh, and yet there's a lot of commonality, especially with the cloud now. Uh, very often, you're you're testing one and the same. It's very difficult to separate the infrastructure layer from the application layer when you're talking about SaaS apps, for example. Um, combined, these two help to form and shape the tech stack for the whole program. What's your, what's your take kind of there on how application security and, and pen testing can work together and what are the results and where have you seen improvements in the tech stack as a result of sort of that joint activity? Yeah, definitely the collaboration, making sure whenever you're building out, you know, the processes and stuff, you're collaborating with each other because there's sometimes the offensive folks are going to have better ideas on certain things than the application security folks. And a good example of that is if you look at web app vulnerability scanners or actually proxy scanners or, or proxy tools like Burp Suite, OWASP, Zap. Zap is a free tool, but that has really been mainly developed by people on the AppSec side. The offensive side, there's some things people understand there. So, you know, you'll see some differences between like AppScan and Burp Suite. The people are writing plugins or more pen testers and not really so much just AppSec folks. So be able to collaborate with those different tools and understanding that. So that shows how the mindsets work in those different areas and why you need to collaborate. And I think education is a good part that, you you know, educating your management, different business units on how pen tests work and how they work together. Uh, one of the things I uh, heard Joe mention earlier is, you know, we're working as a team. So kind of set that level set because a lot of times when you're performing pen tests, people sometimes can get offended. You got some sysadmin that thinks, you know, that their systems are really hardened and they've done a good job. There's no way you can break into it. And then when you do, they kind of get upset. They don't believe your findings. So building that communication and relationship is important. Let them know you're on the same team. Uh, you know, help them out. You know, along the way, if you're an internal resource, share you know resources and things and tips. If you find some uh, different tools or techniques and stuff you can share with them, you think that would help those groups, then share it. And then you know, it's one of the things too with your vulnerability management 
people are doing the re- reoccurring vulnerability scans, you know, kind of help them out, educate them, because that's a, a path for them to go in into your department and keep people within the company without losing them, because someone is doing Nessa scans all the time. They're not going to do that all their career. They're going to want to move into application security or pen testing. So provide paths and education, and that's a good way to retain people. And before I forget about it, you know, one of the best ways to retain people is, is give them training, make their jobs interesting. It's not all about the money, although money's important. You know, people usually leave because they're bored. I've left a couple jobs because I got bored doing the same thing over and over again. So have a career path for those folks and educate them as well as management, people that aren't actually doing the pen tests. Just like I said, the, the role I was in before, I created a PowerPoint slide showing the difference, showing a mapping, comparing vulnerability scans, vulnerability assessments, pen tests, and red teaming. Because it was kind of a funny story, and for those of you that understand red teaming will find this amusing. Uh, we had this manager come in, this director, that was came from an application background, application security background, we had a, a SaaS app and no, it was an SAP app. And he was wanting to have a red team assessment of that application. And so understanding the technology, how that works, I mean, you could red team the environment, but normally, you know, an application, you're not red teaming an SAP app. You know, this critical uh, application run on a mainframe, you don't want to go in there and break something because you're doing some testing that, that, shouldn't be done. I mean, you should do individual testing of that system, but not like a red teaming engagement of an application like that. Yeah. So this, this ties into, you know, not just confusion about the various activities and which, which is which of all scan of pen test, red team, et cetera, but all of it indicates assumptions to me on the part of the business, right? Um, sometimes the assumption is we don't need it. Like you said, the developers are like, oh, we built it strong. We don't need it. Other times the assumptions are, I think, I think Joe even had this example in his presentation of, uh, oh, no, 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 bad guy would never do that. You know, like, like, oh, no one's going to pick up that data and use it that way. It's designed for X. No one would use it for Y. Uh, no one would use that port for X. It was designed for Y. Uh, all those kinds of assumptions and things that take place. Um, curious for the crowd, show of hands, uh, how many, first of all, how many folks have either done app scanning, pen testing, Vuln scanning, red teaming? Raise your hand if you've done all that. Any of it. Yeah, personally. Personally. All right. So, all right. So a good fourth of the room was done at hands-on. How many times did you successfully take advantage of an assumption when you were doing that? Raise your hand if you've ever taken advantage of an assumption in the design of the system you were testing or the network you were testing. Every single hand went back up. So there you have it. Um, all right, so let's talk a little bit about folks that might want to get into pen testing. Let's switch gears a little bit. You're obviously big on mentoring, the teaching, the training, the podcast, the book, everything else you've done. What's your advice to somebody that wants to break into pen testing? But one of the things I'm going to say, if you want to do it, don't doubt yourself. Don't be the blocker that prevents you. Because uh, I saw an interesting meme a while back and, and or a motivational poster saying something, uh, you know, attack it with the confidence of a, a uh, toddler with a superhero T-shirt. Because, you know, when you're that age, you don't doubt what you can do. All kids, like in elementary school, think they can be doctors, think they can be lawyers, astronauts, and all this stuff. They don't have the limitations. As life goes on, we place these limitations on ourselves. Maybe we had some failures, uh, lack of confidence or imposter syndrome, don't think we should do it. Just try it. Give it a shot. Go for it. And one of the things, too, you need to understand is when you're learning to be a pen tester or any other area of offensive cybersecurity, you need to understand the technology. So if you're going to hack into you know, Windows systems and you need to understand the technology, so understanding how to build it, how to protect it, are going to help you. This doesn't mean you have to spend uh, years as a sysadmin. You don't have to start out in IT or help desk. And one of the things I hear a lot of the people trying to break in the industry is someone told me I have to be a sysadmin and start on the help desk or SOC before I move into other areas of security. You don't have to do that. I know a guy uh, that actually had a pool cleaning company, and he just got a job back last year working for the Federal Reserve, making six figures as a penetration tester. First technology job ever. And I've seen... And one of the things as far as encouragement, I had a student in my class a couple years ago at the start of the class. He said, I want to be a pen tester. I want to be really good. I want to, I want to get to your level, but I want to do it faster. Can I do it? I said, yeah, you, the amount of time and effort you put into it, you know, you spend more time studying, you can get into it quicker. You know, so I had like all these years of IT and stuff before I got into it. But uh, yeah, you could do that. And then a week or two later, he says, do I have to read the textbook to be a pen tester? 
And I kind of thought, yeah, this guy doesn't seem like he really wants to try very hard. But I said, yeah, you're just going to need to spend a lot more time with the hands-on stuff in the labs. You know, really work on learning that way, and you'll be fine. Really didn't expect him to get a job. And he turned around like six months or a year later and told me that he had got an internship as a penetration tester, which really kind of surprised me that he made it. So as mentors, don't ever discourage anyone and don't tell people that you have to be a SOC analyst first or whatever. Let them try it. If they're really not meant to be in that role yet, they're going to kind of learn on their own and they'll learn what they need to do to get into it. So basically learn the technology. You don't have to spend a career in that. And and hands-on training, building labs, uh, and also stuff like Try Hack, Try Hack Me and Hack the Box are really good platforms to practice learning those skills. Uh, Try Hack Me I kind of like because it's really beginner-friendly, so you can start out with that. It's... Uh, build some skills up there, and then, you know, you can graduate on to something like Hack the Box. It's a little more difficult. And you can work on some of the certifications. Certifications are more important to people trying to get into the field. You know, if you work for a consulting company, maybe they want you to have certain certifications because then they can sell uh, their service to, to a company better. But when you get some of these firms that are boutique pen testing firms or red teaming firms like your SpectraOps and Lars Consulting, some of these folks don't have certifications don't need it because they're ninjas. They're writing CVEs. They're breaking into stuff. They're figuring out how to hack into stuff. And so they can get by without that. But some of the lesser known uh, consulting companies will want those certifications to be able to sell their services. If it's like something in the government sector, they like some of the DOD certs. So some of those will be helpful. But once you get your foot in the door, then you got the experience in your set. I've got a good friend of mine uh, that I mentored and helped him get his start in pen testing and it was kind of interesting, you know, I first told him, I said, get your OSCP, I'll help you get a job where I'm at. And then I just kind of noticed some other people in the group came in without pen testing experience. It's like, you got the right mindset. And so he bypassed getting the certification. He still doesn't have it, but now he's getting all sorts of, uh, you know, messages from recruiters and stuff trying to recruit him because he's got the experience. So you don't necessarily have to have the certifications, but it can help and it can help getting started out at first. Um, I'm going to go ahead and ask you, and Point noted, you don't have to have the certifications, but if you do want to achieve them in the early stages, what are the best starter certs for a pen tester? I think one of the best certs to have, it's not the easiest, but the OSCP, that carries a lot of weight universally. Some of the INE certs that you learn security-based certs, some of those are kind of popular. Uh, the cyber mentor, Heath Adams, he's got a new cert out that's really starting to catch on. Uh, even Tenable has listed his cert and some other companies. So like some of the more easier ones would be like your EJPT from INE or uh, the Cyber Mentors certification because they're some of the certs like the offensive security certs, they try to be really difficult. So if you have it, it's kind of a badge of honor to have, but there's some of these other certifications that are easier to get into. Pentest Plus is not a bad one and, and sometimes it's having the CEH, but if you're going to work for a company that people are serious and understand pen testing, a lot of times they don't really... Uh, look for people with those certifications. Okay. So you mentioned before imposter syndrome being a, a barrier and how people shouldn't let that get in the way. Just Again, we got a great crowd here. we got like 100 people in this room. Raise your hand if you have in your career ever suffered from imposter syndrome. Half the room at least, right? So don't let that stop you, folks. Everyone experiences it. I personally, as a CISO, have, have walked into rooms before reporting to the board and wondering, how did I get here? Um, all right, so let's switch gears a little bit. You've talked about mentoring. You've talked about authoring books, doing podcasts, teaching, uh, coaching, coaching folks that are coming up through your school. Let's reverse that. Do you have a mentor yourself or more than one? No, I really don't have any mentors. There's people I'll ask questions to. When I got started in the industry, I didn't know any pen testers. So uh, fortunately for me, I was kind of, I did, I was lucky in my research. I found the OSCP certification when I got my first pen testing job. Uh, let's see, I only had like web application vulnerability scanning experience. Uh, I had a sysadmin background and worked in network security and application security, but I didn't have the vulnerability scanning. It's actually funny. I was looking at the job I applied for at Verizon. I got a consulting role, and what helped me get the job was the hiring manager saw that I did a lot of learning on my own, and one of his recommendations is build stuff. You know, he never recommended us to take hacking courses or pen testing courses, he always told us to build stuff. And when you build stuff, you learn the directory structure of Apache web server and figure out how you can, how to secure that and how to break into it. 
And so that was one of his biggest things. So going back, looking at that job description, I looked at all the things I didn't have. It was a lot of it. I had no pen testing experience, but, but I got, but I got the job. And so, um, so fortunately I found, you know, like the OSCP certification because I need to learn how to hack. So I didn't have the hacking skills I knew as a pen tester, you know, it's also referred to as an ethical hacker. So you gotta learn how to hack. So I took that course. I took some of the pen tester Academy courses back when it was security tube. Those were some of my beginning things. I followed a lot of people, I guess not so much had mentors, but I had some people that I followed, uh, on Twitter, like Jason Haddix and, uh, got milk during my studies for the OSCP, following some of these people, reading their blogs and, and learning from them that way. All right, I'm going to throw you a surprise question here. You've given a <laughs> bunch of great advice, a great advice for folks that are coming up through the industry, even advice on how to mentor those who are, for those of us that are already further along in our careers. What's the best piece of advice you've received in your career? You know, one of the best pieces of advice I learned here recently or heard and it's more relevant and I think a lot of us need to think about that because you're spending all this time in your career trying to advance trying to get better you're thinking about your career but you know someone told me recently they said they told me to live your best life so make sure you're taking time out to enjoy life because that's the main reason we do all these careers to begin with it's to give us a better quality of life to be able to you know enjoy time with our family and stuff so make sure you take time away and you avoid getting burnt out. So I think that was some of the best advice I received and something that I'm trying to take to heart myself because I really got burnout towards the end of last year and I thought I was trying to avoid burnout and I actually kind of got burnout. I really, uh, I was you know, recording a podcast. It was a weekly podcast. I was streaming once a week on top of doing, being on other people's podcasts, being on other people's live streams, doing virtual conference talks, teaching workshops and all that stuff, I was really burning myself out. And I really got to the point where, you know, the conference talking and the podcast are okay, but there's a lot of those other things I just really, you know, not in a hurry to get back into full steam. So that's some really good advice, something I should have heard earlier. And it's actually interesting, too, to play into that. Uh, something I heard from John Strand last year, he was even mentioning telling people to get hobbies, to get stuff outside of work, get interest there because if you don't you're going to burn yourself out and you're not going to advance it's going to get to the point and i've been through phases like that and it's been this way for me in the past couple months really not wanting to to learn new stuff or you know hack new things and stuff like that so definitely i think you know having the hobbies and breaking away from the business side of things and just enjoy life so i can thoroughly relate to that uh working at a startup by day uh weekly podcasts uh, articles, blogs, keynotes, presentations, conferences, and all that. But I get away from all that sometimes by um, doing uh, hacking at home and working on uh, cloud certifications. And, you know, I get away from my security career by doing security stuff. Um, okay, so let's see here, switching gears. Uh, quick note uh, for the crowd, uh, ISSA and CSA are both here in the hallway between this room and the vendor room. And if you are not an ISSA or CSA member, I highly encourage that you go and talk to those booths. They're great organizations. Please support them, uh, especially the local chapter. Uh, Dallas chapter of ISSA is a great organization, and I definitely recommend just quick commercial. Go talk to those guys if you haven't. Um, okay, so let's see here. Switching gears a little bit more and, and talking more about back to, the, back to the roots of the pen testing and, and how this kind of program can be put together. So... After you've done vulnerability scans, after you've done penetration testing, let's, let's table the application side for now. Just okay. vulnerability scans leads to pen testing, leads to reporting upstairs. That reporting upstairs piece, what is, what, are, what is your best advice and what tips do you have for folks to show sort of like, okay, so we've done it and we know we've got vulnerabilities. We know we've exploited those vulnerabilities. What is your guidance and advice for taking that upstairs and turning that into something actionable for the security program? Yeah, when you're, you're writing a pen test report, there's an executive summary. So you want to make sure that you really take time and effort to really write a good executive summary because these are the people that are going to, you know, try to get funding to fix the, the vulnerabilities. In some cases, this could be all new technologies. This could be hiring more people, more headcount. So you want to make sure you uh, really explain that to them and the risks involved with that. Let them know the risks involved, you know, because a lot of people at that level, they're looking at things at risks. They don't really care about if it's SQL injection or how you got into the system. They're concerned with the risk. So really, uh, you know, conveying the risk to those folks 
And then also, too, as far as even outside of management, when you're writing these reports up to document, you know, the steps of how you were able to exploit these systems to do a better job of uh, with the technical folks. Because sometimes when people doubt you're able to do this, they need proof. So the more proof you have going into that exit meeting or debriefing, you know, it's go by different terms when you review the report, making sure you really cover that. Because one of the things that can be difficult as a pen tester is supporting that pen test. You go in somewhere and they don't believe it. You're trying to convince them. Sometimes it requires going back and getting more uh, evidence to show them, make sure there's plenty of screenshots. And one thing I think people miss out on, on opportunity is a remediation piece. A lot of times people take very basic information. So spend a little more time on, you know, coming up with a good remediation plan, how to remediate those items and working with the teams to get that done. That's, that's phenomenal advice. How often do you start with threat modeling? Just out of curiosity, stride, dread, these kinds of things. How often do you threat model before you pen test? A lot of that's, you know, if it's a network, you know, or an application, some of those things don't require threat modeling. But when you get into more advanced topics, you know, advanced targets, you take something like a ATM, you know, I work for a bank and we have people do ATM pen tests. So those are important to do threat models because one of the things that you take in consideration is the environment. So if this ATM was outside a house of blues, you know, your physical attacks may not be as risky if you were out East Texas somewhere at a convenience store where security is not driving by and it's out by itself. So the type of tax you have to take in consideration. So the more complex the environment application, the more uh, need for threat modeling. And I think really overall, you should do a threat model of your organization. Look at you know the type of business you're doing, look at the threat, of threat actors that would be targeting your company and a good way to, to leverage that is some of the good information from MITRE. And I mentioned MITRE, that's a good area for people that are not technical on the offensive side to get some ideas of how threat actors think and get some ideas. But yeah, doing overall uh, threat model of an organization, I think is a good idea. Then you kind of know what priorities to put on what areas that needs the, the most focus on your testing. All right, so what about um, how we actually measure the likelihood and the impact? Are you a big fan of CVSS, of FAIR? Like where? Do, where do you fall when it comes to, okay, here's an exploit, here's what we did, here was the vulnerability, here's how we did it, the likelihood that a bad guy can recreate this behavior we created, you know, what's your model there? Do you like CVSS? Yes, and I do think you need to do more than just trust the industry standard. Uh, you need to go in there and look at your environment and, and do that internally, create that internally, because you're going, when you go back to the different threat actors and the likelihood, maybe this certain type of exploit, you can't, you got to take in consideration what you can actually do there. Sometimes the exploits are not really as critical, you know, in this, those circumstances, but I think you do need to work on that and customize that to your organization because sometimes you'll see some vulnerabilities that really it should be higher risk for your organization. So I think customizing that within your envir environment, working with IT risk, helping them understand that. And when you're working with people like an IT risk is help them really understand that because some of those people don't come from a technical background. Uh, I was working on an audit I was doing a uh, Active Directory and Windows penetration test for a company, and was, we were working in tandem with the IT risk folks and helping them understand and go back to education. I think we really need to help those people that are, you know, defining and identifying risk, help them understand, you know, the risks of certain vulnerabilities. All right, so there's a lot of executives listening to this show. What would you like the executive team to know about pen testing, reporting, you go through your activity, you go through your effort, you produce your report, you're taking it upstairs. What do you really wish that the executives knew about your world? Yeah, there's a couple things that I highly recommend a lot is, you know, make sure that you're not testing for compliance because just because you're compliant, you know, the attacker don't care if you're PCI compliant, they're going to breach you, you know, so... Uh, you know, make sure you're working on, you know, you can work on compliance as you're securing things and remediate those vulnerabilities. Uh, I did a pen test when I was consulting for this company. It was an external facing pen test. And I found this vulnerability like in January, and it was low level finding. And a retest was part of this uh, pen test engagement. So 90 days later, I came back and retested. Someone figured out how to exploit that item. Now it was high level risk. So if they hadn't done a retest, they could have been breached. So you want to make sure that you're remediating these items. Don't just go through and accept the checkbox. You're just trying to be compliant. Make sure you do the remediation because, you know, 
unremediated vulnerabilities of what leads to breaches. All right, so I'm, I'm going to state from my experience that the number one problem with pen testing, with vuln management, with red teaming, with all three, is the remediation. That, that that's not an uncommon story at all. Three months later, 90% of the original findings are still on the table. Is that, raise your hand here, show, show of hands again in the room. Is that your experience? Like the bulk of the problem is actually fixing the problems, not finding the problems? Yep, yep, we're getting nods and raised hands everywhere. So partnering with IT, who it's usually them who have to do the patching, right? It's, it's you know, we, we find it, they fix it sort of thing. How do you establish that relationship with those teams? What's your, what's your tips and techniques for working with the IT guys that say, hey guys, we found more stuff. I know we found stuff last time. You know, how do you, how do you encourage and work with them to get them remediating? I think it's that's communication you want to communicate because some companies have remediation teams. They have teams that over oversee the remediation, so maybe they'll go back and retest to see if they've been remediated. But just working closely with those people and showing that they're that how important it is to remediate. Another thing I think can go a long way is I've worked for a lot of companies internally, and maybe there's some certain vulnerability, maybe uh, say like the ILO card on a server. And every time you pen test, you're always finding this vulnerability. Maybe they're using default credentials or maybe they haven't updated to the latest version. If you find stuff that's a pattern, I recommend starting projects. Okay, we found this a couple times. We need to do a project just to go and remediate all this. That way, you know, it could be two years before you pen test this environment and those vulnerabilities are setting there. So you find something that, that you see a lot in your environment, put together, you know, like a project just to go through and start updating these things and remediate because uh, that way, you you know, it's just kind of, as a pen tester, you know, you like to succeed at things, but you hate to come back and see those vulnerabilities still there a year or two later. I mean, I actually know someone that, uh, I don't know if any of you have heard of David Cowan. Uh, he's a digital forensics uh, consultant, and he also teaches for SANS. He used to be a penetration tester, but he got out of penetration testing and moved over to the DFIR side because he was getting frustrated with companies not taking the report seriously. They were getting that check mark. They weren't remediating, and he felt like he was wasting his time. Whereas he worked in incident response, then they're getting value and executing on what what's happening. So make sure you know you're remediating those things and and creating projects to just knock out those things because you can save so much time. And before I forget about one of the things I wanted to mention too is the power of purple teaming. Uh, you know, working with the blue team, you, you got your offensive security folks executing scripts, seeing if they're detected, working to tune those EDR systems to try to detect that. So if you can knock out certain tools out of an attacker's hands, then you know, you're know you going to help reduce some of the risk. And in some cases, maybe you can't eliminate all of it, but you know, you're know you eliminating a certain level of risk. Maybe a nation state may be able to get in there and still do whatever they want to, but you're able to reduce you know a certain level of uh, attacker and, and that helps go a long way because, you know, sometimes it could take several cycles and years for your organization to mature when you're just doing a pen test, remediation, pen test. And if you do things like purple teaming engagements, going through taking the tools out of some of the attacker's hands and just like Atomic Red Team has kind of a cool tool. They've got like some, a version of the Mimikat script that you can run, but it doesn't have a payload. So there's no uh, risk to the environment, but it's checking for signatures and stuff. And so you can kind of do that. That's kind of a good way to, you know, uh, work with some of your junior folks. One of the companies I was working at as a red team lead, uh, one of our junior people, we had them running the purple team engagement. That lets them get familiar with the different tools. And at the same time, you're not wasting your time because you're working with the blue team to try to detect these uh, different types of tools and protect against them. I love that cooperation. I'm a huge fan of purple team personally. Um, so we're going to we're gonna wrap this up. We're going to get into some Q&A here, but i got one last question for you, which is a question I ask every guest. What have you learned outside of cybersecurity that has helped you inside of cybersecurity? And you're not allowed to say, don't wrestle a bear. <laughs> I'm going to say from teaching, just being more patient because, you know, everyone learns at their own pace and maybe the way you explain it's not right, just being patient with people. And because I've had people that I was mentoring and a lot of times you see this as stuff that you could Google. One of the things, if you're trying to help people, you got juniors or you're mentoring, a lot of times you need to learn these key terms before you can Google it, understand that space so people miss things. And I had someone tell me one time, they responded to me because I'll find a URL, text it back to them or email it to them, and I said, thank you for not telling me to Google it. <laughs> but, you know, part of that, you gotta be you got to be patient, and they've got to learn those terms. As people learn it, they'll be able to do that. Or I like that. So how do you want people to reach you? Um, 
Uh, through LinkedIn or Twitter are the best ways to reach me. Okay. All right. So let's open up the floor. Uh, questions for Phil. We can talk about wrestling bears. We can talk about pen testing. <laughs> talk about Phil's background. What do we got here? Dave, you got a question? All right. All right, the, the All right, for the for the room, the question was in a job description for a pen tester, what's in the job description that turns Phil off and what what's in there that that gets him jazzed and he thinks it's a good description? Yeah, so I think you you have to be realistic because some of these roles that they want a four-year degree, they want one or two of these certs, I think they just get kind of too carried away with it. I think just describe what the job entails, the skills needed, because sometimes you get people that the the, the criteria scares them away. And make and as far as like a person writing the job description, make sure you're writing a good, clear job description. I had a case when I was a, a red team lead. We were trying to hire someone from India, and the job description for the red team lead had nothing to do with active director. We kept getting these web app pen tester resumes. And there was no active directory, no kind of Windows experience or none of that in there. So we went back and corrected the resume and we were able to find someone. So uh, just writing an accurate resume, you know, a description, I think sometimes we need to, HR needs to work closely with the, the folks doing this and maybe even look at what some other companies are, look at their job description. Someone is hiring, you know, good level of uh, pen testers because one of the things I'll say too is like locally State Farm has a really great uh, pen test team and red team. So look at some of those folks, some of their job descriptions to see what they're doing. Find out, you know, because a lot of times maybe you're starting to hire pen testers, you don't know how to write a good job description. So just kind of refer to some of those other other job descriptions. And I think too, as far as when you're hiring pen testers, uh, see what their skills are like, not just depend on the certifications, because there's some people that are really good that you're overlooking. Some of the best pen testers I know have like zero certifications. Excellent. All right, got another question from the crowd, Pat. All right, the question uh, for the room, for the audience, um, the role of pen testing in third-party assessment, uh, and the question was, uh, to Phil, does your team participate in third-party assessment? Some, sometimes we do. If we got a new product coming in or whatever, you know, we'll perform tests against things. We, you know, like when, one of the times we were looking at some new wireless solutions, uh, I think Meraki uh, wireless gear from Cisco that we're looking at, so we did some testing in that. But one of the things with us, we stay so busy with with doing mainly PCI pen tests that some things are outsourced to other companies. And All right, we got another question. Uh, all right, so the question question for the audience, um, regarding communications with the executives upstairs and with legal, right? The idea that there's what is right and there is what is legal in across the 50 states, you're going to have different laws, you're going to have different, uh, sometimes conflicting laws. Uh, the example that was given was if you've lost 5% of your healthcare data, are you obligated to report? Some states yes, some no. Uh, Phil, what's your take on that? I think we should rule on the side of, uh, you know, reporting it, because I think we need to be more transparent. I think there's so many things that go unreported there's probably some things that need to and i think by not doing that and not exposing it there could be some underlying issue that could be resolved maybe someone in the community somewhere 
has a resolution for that, it can help you. So I really think we need to err on the side of reporting. I mean, because it's just not fair for people's information to be out there and not know about it. And all right. Mm -hmm. Okay, the follow-up question was, if there is a breach, uh, but you don't know the impact of the breach, what are your reporting obligations? Yeah, I think just kind of minimal what you know at the time, and then once you have like an IR incident response done on it, once you know more, then go back and follow up. Yeah, I personally, I've, I've been through this. Um, I've been through this where uh, the breach occurred, but the, the impact is not understood. And to your original question about what's right versus what's legal, you obviously are working with your own general counsel. Um, but it has been my personal experience, having worked in the services industry especially, transparency with your clients whenever possible is the best outcome, is the best way to manage it, whether there's a certain amount of legal risk there or not. Because at the end of the day, if the breach occurs and the bad thing happens, it's going to turn out to be worse than you thought originally. It will turn out to have impacted more than you think originally. And it's best to come out and say, hey, there has been a thing, we're still investigating, we don't know the depth of it yet, but there has been an event. We're researching the event. We will keep you posted and to proactively as much as you can communicate with clients, stakeholders, outsiders, clients, customers, whoever's data that is that might be impacted. I'm a, I'm a big proponent in transparency and honesty about each step of the process. Another question. Yep, we'll start with uh, Dan. All right. I think, think that question for the audience. Sorry, we got a nobody. Nobody can hear him. Uh, question for the audience was: uh, You're working with the IT teams, the technical teams. You're finding problems. You're finding exploits. You're 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 finding vulnerabilities. And you're exploiting them, and it's because of say configuration choices that they made. How do you maintain the positive relationship in the face of you should have, you could have, uh, when you're constantly unearthing the things basically that they're doing wrong? Yeah, I think going back to relationships, you you need to build that rapport, and I think as the security person or the offensive security person. That you need to not be condescending and, you know, you know, like you're trying, like you're their parent trying to tell them to do this or that. You need to, to work with them and just kind of recommend things to them and share that instead of, you know, you don't want to make them regret every time they see you because you're going to come with bad news. Just, you know, work with them as a team member and be respectful of what they're doing. And, and that even goes back to, you know, one of the things I practice as a pen tester from based on my IT career as a sysadmin is making sure when you're doing pen tests and stuff, you're careful not to do things unnecessary to make the, the environment stable. And I think if you do that too, you kind of get the respect, let them know that you know, you're in this together, you're not wanting to break things, and then share the information with them. I think just kind of also too, you see things come out, your Windows administrators, you see certain things, just kind of share it with them, just kind of get that rapport and that relationship going. And I think it's just a lot easier to, you know, give that, deliver that information in a positive manner. All right, we had one question here. Okay, the, the question was, it was a really good question too, it's in three parts. It's all about bug bounties. We didn't talk about bug bounties yet, which is sort of outsourcing your, you know, your attacking. Um, the first question was, uh, how, how useful is it for training people? The second question was, um, how do you manage it? What's the efficacy? Have you seen it be successful? And the third question was, uh, what about people exploiting a bug bounty situation to exploit zero days and sell them to someone else? Yeah, I think bug bounties can be a good addition I actually was, for a while, I was an ambassador for Bug Crowd. And part of the reason I did that was because it's a good way for people to get experience that wants to get into pen testing. And last year before last, I was interviewing 
And the hiring manager for this consulting company said it was easier for them to find web app pen testers because of that. I think bug bounty programs are good. Something else you may want to put in place because you could have someone like, uh, you know, Hacker One or Bug Crowd manager bug bounty programs, or you can do it internally. A lot of companies I know will have a dedicated person internally that works with the bug bounty programs as kind of the, the liaison. And I think that's a good learning experience. If you got someone internally that's working on the offensive side or application security side, have them working with those because they learn a lot of new tools and cool tools and techniques on how to do things. So it's a good learning experience. So I think that's good. And also have like a disclosure program. So someone just finds that, uh, have a disclosure program in place. So maybe they don't even have to go to the bug bounty company or maybe they can report those through the bug bounty company because there's sometimes things that may not be included in a bug bounty that someone finds and you want them to be able to report it. And we need to also make sure that when you're working with those people, let's not, because you know, sometimes people find stuff and the company's on the offensive, they're worried it's going to get out. You know, be nice to those people. Uh, just kind of deal with them in a professional manner that you're welcoming that instead of people being scared to report it. I mean, there was like the DJI drone uh, company had like a bug bounty several years ago and some people in the community had found a bug and they reported it and they came back and tried to threaten legal action on them. So I think you really have to kind of be on the up and up with it and, and work with them fairly because otherwise they're not going to help you. And, and if they find stuff like that, yeah, they'll turn around and try to sell the exploit to someone instead of report it responsibly. Yeah, that's, that's a fair response. Any questions? we got one question left. we got room for one. we got one question from Joe. Beautiful. All right. Joe's that's offering a, up some red teaming books to the crowd. That's a good book. I actually have that book myself. And this is kind of a good book for managers to learn how to run red team programs. Excellent. All right. Well, ladies and gentlemen, thank you all for coming on down to the ranch. Thank you, listeners. Thank you, Philip Wiley. Y'all be good now.